we have some uh, special coverage here for you. And this is uh, a podcast that uh, our great friend, uh, Dr. Mike, had that he came up with an idea for putting together some of the uh, top survivor medical minds that we know to answer some questions about the crisis going on around uh, COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Mike, thank you for uh, putting this all together. How are you, Dr. Mike? Hi, guys. And thank you, everybody, for coming on. I think, you know, and Rob, thank you for having this podcast. I think there's a few things. One, I think there's so much, I want to do this because there's so much information, misinformation, fear, anxiety, and all sorts of other things out there. This is like an emotional roller coaster right now. And if Candace, John, and I, and you could go and say to the survivor community and maybe pass it on to other people that, look, we're going to get through this, but these are what we believe are some of the steps you can do to sort of help you get through this, then I think, how can we not be there for our community? Okay, so we're very excited to have here with us on the panel. Uh, doctors Candace and John Cody are also uh, here with us tonight. Uh, Candace and John, how are you two doing? We're great. We're sitting one room away. <laughs> Yes. Other. Okay. Uh, very happy to have us uh, have you both here with us. Uh, I, I, you know, I wish it was under better circumstances, and so uh, you know, hopefully, we'll get to talk some Survivor uh, with you guys uh, in, in the upcoming future. But uh, not what we're here to talk about tonight. That's right. It's we're not. we're happy to be here, and we're happy to um, help share like Dr. Mike said, help share some information with people, answer some common questions that people have, get some some data and facts out there, and to help people understand how and why it's important to get through this while following the recommendations of social distancing and basic hygiene. Yeah. John, we how all, are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Rob. Uh, the other thing we wanted to, to talk about, uh, Dr. Mike brought it up before the start of the podcast, was just to, a little disclaimer. None of the three of us are epidemiologists or virologists. We're just physicians that are concerned about our communities and uh, the survivor community, but our communities as a whole. And we just want to get as much information out there as possible and debunk some myths, things like that. But uh, overall, we're doing very well with our social distancing in the Cody household. Okay. Yes. You've even social distanced each other uh, from each other in the same house. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very smart. <laughs> Very smart. Okay. So yeah, to follow hold on to follow up on what John said, this is not medical advice that we're giving. This is John, Candace, and Mike talking to you guys as friends and family and part of our community and saying, look, this is what we were, we're doing with our family. This is what we would be doing if we were you. This is what I would tell any friend of mine anywhere in the world. And hence, I'm going to impart what I know onto you guys, but not advice, not medical advice, just Best take practices. it for what it is. Yeah. Um, based on the information that we have currently today on uh, March 15th. 2020. And so i um, very excited to have you all here with us to talk about this, that uh, Candace and Dr. Mike have been answering so many people's questions uh, that uh, my, my mentions have just exploded between uh, you guys answering all these questions for people. So uh, you guys are already uh, doing a, a great service to the Survivor fans. Thank you. I, okay. I think we can probably start by saying, I mean, maybe Candace or John, you guys can just go through what the basics are. Like what coronavirus is because there are going to be some people listening to this that don't watch the news and just like where we speculate what coronavirus is like why it's not the flu why it's spreading so much faster it seems than the flu and what are just some of the basic common sense things that we can do i uh, normally that's a lot of questions <laughs> Um, so I guess I can start with, um, you know, coronavirus is a new virus that we haven't seen before. Um, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of things that people don't really care about, but we believe that it, it jumped from animals to people. And that's why it's a, a type of, it's a virus that we haven't seen before. Um, it causes severe respiratory, um, symptoms and is causing, um, a worldwide now pandemic. So, 
Um, it's important because it's a new virus. It's a new virus that no one has has had before. So no one has antibodies to this virus. So no one has an immune response that is able to help um, squash this virus, basically. So your body hasn't seen this before. Um, so um, it has about a two week period of, um, of asymptomatic time period when you could be passing this virus to other people without knowing that you're sick. So this is why it's spreading so quickly because we have well looking people walking around and spreading it to, to people and before they know that they're, they have it. And I think that was a lot of our questions was, can it spread beforehand? And I think the answer is, or at least as far as we know is yes. Can it spread while you have the virus, like active virus? The answer is obviously yes also. And then the question of, can it spread after the virus, like after you've been cured or, or healed from the virus? And I don't know if any of us know that yet, which right, I don't, don't know, know. what, yeah, it, we're not that far out because it is so new. We're talking, it seems like this is less than six months old. We've, we're in uncharted territories with this form of coronavirus that is, that's brand new. And then a lot of this is, you know, a lot of what we're doing here is trusting medical research and medical experts coming out of other places that we don't necessarily know that we can trust. And, and that's, you know, so a lot of these questions we can only answer with certain degrees of medical certainty because this virus has outpaced our medical literature at this point. I think it's fair to say that all the testing is very new too. So with any of these epidemiologic studies, you we know a lot of things. And as our society gets information very quickly from social media and they can go on any news site.com and, and figure things out very quickly and get a lot of information. And some of it's false, but there's a lot of good information out there and a lot of facts. The problem is those facts are predicated on the ability to gather appropriate information. The testing that we have is not perfect for this virus. Uh, some early tests have been found to show a lot of false positives. Some had false negatives. So in order for us to know definitively things like mortality rate, um, you know, actual like rates of infectivity and all those sorts of things, we have to know what the denominator of patients is. But we don't know that because we don't know who has it, who doesn't have it. And that also, you know, you get to the point of asking about, can people get reinfected? Well, if the testing is not perfect, we don't really know if somebody's really cleared the infection. So while there are some reports of people being reinfected, did they ever really clear it? I don't know that we know that. So I think uh, the point is that the research is just very new and we haven't really seen something like this in, in really our lifetimes. And I think I think that goes to the point of there are a lot of really good questions out there that people are asking questions that I would like to know the answer to and everyone else would, too. But we don't know the answer. So let's talk about the things that we do know the answer to and the things that we can affect. And let's focus on those things now. Um, and, and later we will find out and we will let you know there will be literature. But the things that we know now are. Um, clearly everyone knows about the hand hygiene and the social distancing. I think a problem that we're seeing now is that we're asking people to, to practice the social distancing, but they don't understand when they're getting a, a message that says young people will be okay. They won't be affected by this. Then why should young people stay home? Right. I mean, I think that I get so frustrated. I am, well, I don't think I know I'm frustrated when people say to me, Oh, well, it's just the old people and the immunocompromised that are dying. Well, what makes America a great society is that we help the old people and the sick people and the immunocompromised. We're not supposed to let these people die. Like that's not okay. And that shouldn't be, nobody should be okay with that, with that comment. And it's so also not just, it's also not a hundred percent accurate because there are people that are young and healthy that are getting infected and, and having serious issues. And it's not just the death with, you know, it's, while the survivability seems to be pretty reasonable uh, for this disease, people that do survive often have prolonged courses in the ICU where they need ventilator, you know, ventilator support um, in, in you know, severe cases. And while most people may get mild or moderate symptoms and don't need that, the people that do need it need it for a long period of time, and it eats up an awful lot of uh, healthcare resources. Now, it's not just the healthcare resources that are geared toward caring for these people. 
it's healthcare resources that are caring for these people that are now no longer able to care for other people that get this virus or other people that get other things that go wrong with them that we now have to manage them differently because we don't have bed space. We don't have surgeons that can do stuff. We don't have anesthesiologists that are free to take care of, um, you know, uh, acute gallbladder infections and, and things like that. We may have to manage some of these things differently um, if our healthcare system is overrun. So the whole purpose of the social distancing is basically that we're, we're putting a pause on trying to put a pause on the silent period of spread of the disease. So basically if you don't go out to those unnecessary social events and you keep yourself away from other people and practice good hygiene and, and, and do all the things that the CDC and other people are recommending and you do it now when you do it for two weeks, at the end of two weeks, most people that have symptoms or most people that have the virus will have, will be exhibiting some symptoms and will have, will know who is sick at that point. And then it'll be a lot easier to tell who needs to be in quarantine or isolation or who shouldn't go out and that sort of thing. But until those people, until we have that pause, we're not going to know who's actually infected because it takes anywhere from seven to 14 days to start manifesting symptoms when you contract the virus. So while it seems like it's an overreaction. Mike, you're going to have to wash your hand. You just touch your nose. Oh, God. <laughs> well, it seems like. Well, it seems like an overreaction. I did see a great quote today that linear solutions almost never tackle exponential problems. So the idea of us doing this is that in a few months, hopefully if everyone does this or a large enough portion of society does this social distancing and good hand hygiene, that in, a, in three or four months, we can all look back and say, hey, maybe that was an overreaction. And that's the whole point. We want to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think in terms of social distancing, you have to sacrifice. I think we have to be aggressive in the amount that we sacrifice right now, whether it's not allowing your kids to go and have play dates at other people's houses or not going to your restaurants or not going to the bars. You saw that, I think Ohio just closed all of its bars and restaurants. So did we have to be aggressive. It's going to hurt, but I it's going to be worth it in the end because we're going to save lives. And I think I saw one paper today saying that if you start social distancing now versus waiting for a quarantine I, a week from now, then it, we will decrease the number of cases in the long run by like 40%, which right. I mean, is an astronomical it's actually number. Even, even sooner than that. I think it was only a couple of days. Like if you wait really? 48 hours to start it, yeah. Um, it's just because we're in the exponential growth curve right now. So mm -hmm. every day or two that we wait and don't do this, it's not, we're not panicking, but it's just be taking it seriously. And, and it doesn't mean you have to buy 400,000 rolls of toilet paper. Like mm -hmm. you can, you know, a reasonable amount of toilet paper is fine, but, um, you know, just be socially aware and, and responsible. Well, can let's I, talk about, yeah, go ahead. Nicole, I, I just want to make one, I just want to make one comment <laughs> about, um, the toilet paper because a friend of mine sent me, you know, a, uh, an analogy. Remember when you went to the grocery store and you were looking for toilet paper and you couldn't find any because everybody was using it, right? Well, guess what? When you go to the hospital and you're looking for a ventilator and everybody's using them, you're not going to be able to get a ventilator to save your life. That's the that's the issue while we're trying to flatten the curve and do the social distancing so that we don't overwhelm the healthcare, um, the the healthcare system, so that we have resources available to to spread out the presentation of the number of cases that come, so that we stay under the the um, the critical point of what the healthcare system can handle. So that that's what the social distancing is about to, to flatten that curve down so that it's not a spike all at one time so that we see everyone coming at one time that needs the resources and we don't have enough resources to help them. So, so Candace, uh, that, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, what I, what I wanted to know was that the, at the point that we've started the social distancing here in this country, did have we started it at an earlier point than some of these other countries that have had these major problems like Italy, or did they start doing these uh, similar measures around the same time? I think it seems like some of these countries did not social distance for too long. Like when you look at, I believe, the Italy's, the Iran's of the world. When you look at, I want to say like South Korea, it was very quickly. And so they got a hold on this virus very quickly. But I could be wrong in terms of 
you know, because mm-hmm. there's been so much information coming out. I could be wrong on how fast I, we social distance versus I, others. I think you're right. I think, you know, I've seen also um, graphs sh- comparing different cities in China and how how long they waited versus how quickly they enacted the social distancing and the quarantines and lockdowns. And this the cities that, you know, within 48 hours locked down had a much flatter curve than, uh, let's say, for instance, Wuhan, when they started the lockdown, they were at like 400 some cases. So I would say I think we're a little bit lagging behind and we're at, at a risky, very risky point here. Um, and I'm glad that we're starting to get these closures because, uh, better late than never, but I think people are, are not understanding why they need to take it seriously and why it applies to them when they're not in the high risk group. Mm -hmm. So are people allowed to keep the windows open? It was one of the questions that that we had on Twitter. So I think the answer is yes, right? Of course you can have your windows open. But how long does the virus stay on different types of surfaces? Because this has been a big question for the people when they're getting food delivered or when they're walking in a mall, if they're using an escalator. And there's been some studies on this stuff. Do you guys want to take this? Or, you know, I know, Candice, you tweeted about this already. Uh, Yeah. So um, the data shows that um, aerosols can remain in the air. Now, these are they're, they're very small particles. Um, it can remain in the air for up to three hours. Um, cardboard, it can last for 24 hours. And then you've got um, basically plastic and stainless steel where it can last for three days. And then the copper is four hours. Although I don't think that's really that relevant. Um, but I think it's a good question um, about food deliveries as well. Um you know, we had uh, our groceries delivered uh, this morning and I spoke with the um, delivery person and uh, he talked to me about the um, uh, steps that they're taking uh, to be careful when they're delivering to other people. I said, I hope that you're not touching the doorknobs of anyone's houses as you're going in and out. I hope you're not you handing your pen to everyone who uh, has to sign for this. And he said, no, I don't even carry a pen. And I sanitize my gloves before and after every time I go into someone's house and touch their groceries. So, cause I told him, I said, your gloves protect you, but they don't protect you from, from sharing the germs from your gloves, from someone else's house to the next person's house. Mm-hmm. And so I spoke with him about that. And he said that they have all these, um, you know, things set in place. Now this is the company that I use, um, but it's a large chain. And I would assume that large chains um, have the same type of strict, uh, rules set in place so that because no business wants to be you know have the outbreak pinned on them they're being careful now if you were traveling guys would you i mean i would think that all of us would agree that all non-essential travel like vacations going on airplanes should be stopped at this point just don't do it right <laughs> it's a, now, we, we've had some uncomfortable conversations with with friends and family and it's uh because it, and we have canceled things ourselves. We had we had plans with friends um, several times, like over the next few weeks, and we've just not done it. And um, you know, I think it's just I personally wouldn't be happy to know that I was a reason why some other people got infected. Um, yes, I also don't want to get this, but being that I'm young and healthy, I, I would probably be okay if I contract the virus. But I I would not want to pass it along for, as a socially you know, conscious individual, I want to pass along to a bunch of people that may not be okay if they get it. And that's, you know, that's really the, that's really the issue. So for travel, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, oh, it's just my parents that are coming to town. It's like, okay, well, if they're, your parents are coming to town and they're flying through two different airports um, and they're coming into contact with tons of different people, you know, if your parents are in their sixties, I mean, you're putting them at risk, you know? And so, you know, I'm, uh, unless we get in a situation where Candace or I, you know, falls ill, you know, we've basically told our parents not to come, you know, and we'd love to see them, but we're just not doing that. And so, yeah, I agree. I think, you know, the people, I get a little frustrated seeing uh, these things online about how cheap these airline tickets are to, to Greece and Vegas and all this stuff. And I just, uh, the one word I'd say to you is uh, just don't, just don't go. If um, you had to travel because you're like an essential sure. worker, would you wear a mask? 
I think the, the recommendations are that you only wear a mask if you personally are sick. I think mm -hmm. I don't, you know, our goal is to not, you know, spark panic, but to just increase awareness and common sense measures that we can all take on a daily basis. I think wearing a mask, if you travel, if that makes you feel comfortable, that's, I guess, it's okay. But in general, you want to limit your mask use uh, unless you have symptoms and you're worried about infecting other people. Um, because otherwise you want to make sure that the healthcare providers, uh, have use of the masks. Um, but I, but I will add to that. Um, uh, we all touch our face right. unconsciously many, many times an hour. It's very difficult to remember not to do these things. So if you can find a cloth mask or something that's just a reminder to put on your face to block your hand from going to your nose or mouth and that's helpful, then I think that's something that's reasonable to do if it helps you practice hygiene better. I'm not talking about a medical grade mask. I'm not talking about um, the N95 or the things that the healthcare workers need to stay safe. And, and I'm not saying that the virus can't go through a cloth, cloth mask. It's a, it's a physical reminder to have you maintain that hygiene. I don't think that's unreasonable. Now, what should somebody do if they're sick right now? So not necessarily with the coronavirus. I have a cold. I have a, you know, a fever of 99.2. My cough is a little dry. I think, you know, probably... 10% of America has become a little psychosomatic of how do I know I don't have coronavirus right now? I, what do you recommend all of these people doing? I would say call your doctor. Mm -hmm. Don't go to the hospital unless, unless you need medical care. Okay. You're not going to show up at the hospital to get a test or to ask, do I have coronavirus? Telemedicine, use telemedicine and that your doctor can direct you to as to whether they feel that you need to have a test and where you can get the test because you can't get the test if you show up at every hospital. You may have shown up at the hospital, they decide that they're not going to test you and then you've exposed yourself to mm -hmm. some other positive patients. So call before you go unless you're experiencing symptoms where you think you need shortness of breath, where you need medical attention, I would call first. But and again, that's not, that's not medical advice. If you need medical attention, please call 911 or go to the hospital. But I think if you don't need medical attention right away, urgently call. Yeah, I do think that, you know, part of the push for people to say things like, hey, everyone needs to calm down. We, you know, it's not that big a deal. It's just like the flu. First of all, it's not just like the flu. Um, much higher uh, infection rates uh, and the mortality rates we think are going to be a little bit higher. But again, we're not going to know that for a long time. But uh, it the, more, the morbidity is higher. The morbidity is higher than the flu. You know, the, the people that recover um, they're, um, that have severe cases, they, they take a lot more medical resources and a lot more medical support. But the thing is, most people, most cases are not, they don't require significant medical attention. So you may just feel like you have a case of the flu or you have, a, you know, a fever and, and body aches, and, and that doesn't necessarily need to be in a hospital at all. You know, you don't have to go to the ER for that. Um, you do need to quarantine. Likely, Right. You do need to quarantine and you do need to, you should call your doctor and, and, and ask the advice and, you know, follow the guidelines, cdc.gov. They have guidelines that are written out pretty clearly about what you should do if you feel that you are sick um, and, and sort of when to seek medical attention um, and, and those sorts of things. And so, you know, the idea is that you don't necessarily have to panic because most people, again, will just will have mild or moderate symptoms that can be managed without significant medical care. But, if all of those people are outside of the community, they're going to vastly increase the volume of patients that have the severe and critical cases that, that need medical support. So um, you don't need to freak out and panic about it, but you just need to be cognizant about uh, what it means if you become sick and, and contact your doctor and follow the guidelines of the CDC. Can we talk through what that mild case looks like? Because I think that that will probably be the case for most people who come down with this. We're in this period where we're in, you know, uh, this uh, social distancing period where people feel sick. They're going to stay home. Is it important to be tested for coronavirus if you're somebody that feels like you've come down with something or if the symptoms 
aren't too severe. Just stay home, get rest, and make sure that you're isolated for the period of two weeks? What I mean, what I would say is if you have a dry cough and you have a fever, then isolate yourself and hang in there. Take some, you know, just like you drink chicken soup and you drink a lot of water and some Gatorade. And at the point where you're not feeling well and you would normally go to the doctor because you're sick and you feel like, wow, I'm really sick. I should go to the doctor. That's when you should go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. If you're not at the point where you wouldn't normally go to the doctor, don't go to the doctor because you think, oh my God, I have coronavirus. I mean, that's- right. And I think, an, I think an important turning point is also having shortness of breath. Yeah. Um, if you start having shortness of breath, you need to seek medical attention because when you start having shortness of breath, I think generally looking at uh, the, the course of the a severe disease or, or a more moderate case, um, the time between having shortness of breath and then going, progressing to severe symptoms and needing respiratory aid is only a few days. So I, one to two days. So I would not delay if you start having shortness of breath. And I'll add to the fever, um, subjective fever, body aches and chills. Is there a certain uh, t uh, temperature that you feel like that you are, uh, once you pass that, you're in uh, an especially dangerous spot? John, John <laughs> loves to talk about fever. <laughs> the, the medical diagnosis of fever is greater than 100.4 degrees. Um, there is some debate on that, but, uh, you know, 98.6 is what people think as far as the, um, you know, average body temperature. So if you, you know, people come into our office all the time and say, oh, well, I normally run cold. So 99 degrees is a fever for me. It, that's not going to fly out of you go to an ER. They're not going to treat you for that. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're consistently over a hundred degrees, you know, really a hundred point, one hundred point four or higher, uh, that's a real fever. Um, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to the ER for that. And then but you should, what, but you should quarantine, you should self self quarantine, even inside your house, you know, you should, um, you know, avoid, you know, the, the high, when they talk about levels of risk of people to contract the virus. So regular social contacts within six feet, that's actually considered a moderate risk by the CDC. Uh, for contracting the virus, the people that are at highest risk are um, healthcare professionals, people that are constantly in contact with patients that are going to have the virus, um, and then intimate contacts, your your kids, your wife, your your parents that they live with you, um, people that are inside your household that are constantly you know touching all the things that, that you're touching. So th th those are the high risk transmission people. So, you know, for, for us, if um, I were to get sick, I would uh, probably quarantine myself in the basement. We have a, we have a, we have we a family plan, you know, you, set up, yeah. someone brings you your food in a different room. You, you, br you bring them the food, you drop it off and then you pick it up. That person should stay in that room or stay in that, that part of the house. If you're able to do that, if you have that kind of setup, mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, but try not to, don't share a bed if possible. Um, yeah. don't share towels what we're doing in our house is we're washing all of our clothes on the highest heat or sanitize. And we're using, we usually wash dishes by hand. We're using a dishwasher and we're putting the utensils and everything on highest heat. Now, is that going to save us? We don't know, but why not try? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, an especially uh, scary scenario, especially that we're all, you know, social distancing. And uh, my, my wife is a nurse and we've talked about, you know, uh, what what do we do if uh, we both end up getting sick? Like, how are we supposed to take care of uh, uh, how are we supposed to take care of our kids if both of us uh, are ever at a point where are we uh, like are sick as a dog? Like, uh, how, how does that work? So uh, the, but, but the Rob, more she's been social distancing with you for a long time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So it's, yeah, it's definitely it, right? something <laughs> worth talking about and trying to make sure that the that both people in a in a couple aren't sick at the same time as much as you can help it uh well, is is very important this is a good well it's a good point that you bring up rob um you obviously have thought this through john and i have also thought this through i think uh other families have too what you need to do is you need to set up a community of people who are willing to help each other out uh, you've got older folks in your community that may need groceries delivered that may need medications delivered um, uh, and may need help. And like you said, if both parents get sick, somebody's going to have to take care of their kids. So you need to set up a, a social, um, support network. Like a chain of custody. Really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And then in in terms of the the children, you know, uh, t- tell me if that uh, I you know I may have uh, misinformation here, but you know, um, w- one of the things that I've been uh, reading is that children do not get sick, or it's extremely rare that children are getting sick with the uh, coronavirus. Is, is that accurate? And then is there any special precautions that we need to be taking with our young children while this outbreak is going on? Yeah, I mean, your kids may not exhibit symptoms, uh, but they absolutely can be Carry. vectors for yeah. carrying vectors. the virus They're and vectors, infecting, yes. infecting other people. So I guess, you know, if you're both, if, uh, you know, if Candace and I were both get sick, but we were to have mild, a mild case, you know, we, we shouldn't be fearful of, of, you know, doing daily things with our kids. We should do the things we normally do, wash our hands and they should wash their hands and things like that. We would keep, obviously, if they weren't already out of school, we'd keep them out of school to prevent them from passing on to other children. But the the danger of children uh, becoming ill, you know, fortunately, this is it's not really been a, a big thing with this virus, which is um, probably the one good thing about it. It doesn't mean they don't have it; they don't get it and can't carry it. But they they just they're not exhibiting symptoms. But let's not uh, say that for all children, because there are groups of children that are at increased risk because there are um, children that have transplant, children that are chronically immune, immunocompromised, that are on immunomodulatory drugs. So uh, those those children, we are going to put also in the same risk group as the older people with comorbidities. So we have to be extremely careful around those children as well. Can we talk about that? Which category? So... How do you recommend people behaving if they are do have comorbidities like COPD, cardiac disease, diabetes, or even there was a bunch of questions about being pregnant? So uh, you want to talk about the high risk uh, groups? I think, uh, well, let me just hit on the pregnancy one because that, I think that's a one that a lot mm. of people are asking about. Um, pregnant women are technically in an immunocompromised state. Um, they're not necessarily that much, uh, more at risk than the general population of their age, which is what we have seen for the most part coming out of the data from China, which is very limited. Okay. There's not that much data on this. So we, this is mostly conjecture, um, but, uh, I think that most women who are pregnant are, um, by nature nervous about protecting the baby anyways. So I don't think that these women are at a great risk of being the ones that are going out and doing these social groups and, and not paying attention to the social distancing. I think these are the people who are being careful. Um, so I think they should continue doing what they're doing, which is the hygiene being careful, attend your regular OB visits and follow their advice. There's no need to be overly nervous about the baby. Um, there's, there's no evidence that the virus can, is going into the amniotic fluid. There's no evidence that the virus is being transmitted from mother to baby. Um, I think there was one case where um, the a neonate was found to be um, an infant was found to be positive, but they believe that was not transmission from mother to baby um, in utero; that it was just respiratory droplet. So again, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things that we don't we don't know. Uh, the CDC's guidelines uh, talk about. Basically, we we don't really know about the effects of the virus on on the pregnancy, on the on the developing fetus, and everything. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that pregnant women need to panic, like Candace said. As far as the other medical comorbidities, um, people that are a little bit older and then have other medical issues, um, and, and there are some reports of certain medications uh, putting patients at risk. Uh, I've heard a lot of conflicting literature on that. So I don't want to go uh, specifically out there and, and scare anybody about it. But there are there are some thoughts that certain medications will place patients at higher risk. Um, you just, you know, these are the people that should take it seriously. You know, they, you know, I'm not, I think everybody should take it seriously. But these, these are the people that may be in their 40s and 50s, but they have these other issues. They're the ones that may have these more severe cases that, that you hear about coming from Italy. Um, and so, you know, not everybody who's 40 or 50 uh, is physiologically the same. 
And, uh, you know, we all have, you know, everybody's a little bit different. And some people have more medical issues and those people with medical issues or immune compromised states may be affected much more significantly from this virus. So um, that's why, you know, the num- we don't know a whole lot about treatment yet. Um, there's some early treatment stuff out there, but it's still very new. Uh, we don't have a lot of studies on it. So the best thing we can do is try to limit the exposure of the people. Um, and so I, I want to touch a little bit about um, the social distancing and people ask, you know, what does that mean? A lot of questions we're getting. We just got a question here about, you know, I'm going to go walk outside with a friend. How far apart should we walk? Um, you know, the CDC recommends for droplet precautions, you should be six feet away from people. Um, and the primary vector for transmission is thought to be large droplet from sneeze and coughing of that sort of thing. But that's not the only thought, um, of transmission, you know, uh, surfaces that people touch, you know, um, credit cards. Uh, handling money, all, all these things, pumping your gas, like they, the, the virus can be in all these areas. And so um, that's why the hand hygiene is very important and avoiding touching your face and things like that. Um, some, somewhere 60 to 80% of the population is going to be exposed to the virus. Um, so this is something that it, it's going to happen, but it doesn't mean you have to panic about it. It just means that we should, we should do these things. So yes, if you're having a dinner party of uh, you know, two couples that are coming over to your house, you know, is that safe? If nobody has symptoms for a couple of weeks, maybe, but you don't know what those people have been doing. They may bring it into your house. I just think it's, you know, for a couple of weeks of, of uncomfortable, uh, you know, somewhat awkward social isolation to maybe protect a large member, a large portion of society, it's worth it. And, and you don't have to freak out about it. Just, you know, be a little antisocial for a couple of weeks. And it's yeah. not, you know, it should be a lot better. I mean, it can, it can really mean the difference in, in thousands and thousands of lives. Yeah, be safe, not sorry. Yeah. And I'm just going to say that straight up, I told my parents who are both in their 70s that they should probably socially isolate. That not, yeah. I mean, social distancing is one thing that I said, get some food, hunger down. It's not worth the risk. And yeah. so when you talk about these <clears throat> immunocompromised people, and does that mean that if you have Crohn's disease and you're in your 40s, or you have type 2 diabetes, or I, and you're in your 50s, Everybody's body is different, like John says, but it's always better to be safe than sorry with your health and literally, like John said, all of society. I mean, society is at risk at this point. Nobody right. wants you to should, be that you, high. Look, I want, you know, people should be able to maintain their, um, you know, if you have doctor's appointments that are somewhat somewhat urgent, you know, or you feel like you need to see a doctor for something else that's kind of urgent, then, you, you know, you can keep those appointments. You know, if you need to, to do something for your for your children, you can you can do that. But what I I don't mean to take your your kids to their swimming lessons. You know, I don't, you know those yeah, don't take them to the, the group soccer game that's going on because everyone's out of school. You know, it's not a time to get all your kids together for play dates because they're out of school. The idea is that they're out of school, so they're not together and spreading the disease to each other. So, um, but you know, you don't necessarily have to go and buy six weeks worth of groceries and you know live in a bomb shelter in your basement. You can. You can go out, you know, we've taken our kids to park, the park every day, um, you know, and there are other children that are there. There are parents. We keep our distance. Um, we're just careful that, you know, we, we maintain personal hygiene. We sanitize our hands if we're concerned. And, and then when we come home, we, we want everyone washing their hands thoroughly. And, um, you know, we're just, we're just careful to, to maintain good personal hygiene, but we're not, you know, living in absolute isolation. Um, but I think said, the people that are more at risk, they probably should, I, I agree with you, Mike, they probably should, you know, be a little more conservative than that. Mm-hmm. Do you, I mean, I think there were a lot of questions about ibuprofen, Motrin, Advil, they, they're all the same drug guys. I, and whether, <laughs> well, I'm saying that to the audience, not to you. I know. It's a, me, I know. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, so I, and whether or not, you're telling my trade secrets, Mike. Yeah. Whether or not <laughs> anti-inflammatory drugs like that I can actually cause the virus to spread faster or worsen the virus if you have it. I, do you guys want to tackle John, do you want to answer that or you want me to work? So I, I mean, I don't, I, I have been reading a little bit about that. I just, I saw something, you know, pop up on social media. I haven't, I haven't uh, read any big time vetted studies. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, on it, but there there is some thought that anti-inflammatory medications may predispose you to a more serious um, 
more serious uh, version of the virus or, or something like that, or you may have more more significant symptoms. I, I don't. There I don't may be some correlation, we but we're not sure if there's any causation. Right. right. I mean, I think so, that that technology yeah. that the virus has outpaced scientific data and evidence based medicine when it comes to this. And what Absolutely. I would say is, look, if you're exhibiting symptoms like shortness of breath and fever, go to the doctor and trust your doctor. You know, yeah. call your doctor and ask him. It's until you get to the point where you're going to the doctor, it's probably safe to take Tylenol. And if all you have is Motrin or you're allergic to Tylenol, probably you can take it. Is I wouldn't not take it because there's some random things that you find on the internet. Right. But it, and if there is a suitable alternative and it makes you nervous, it's just fine to take the suitable alternative. Like mm -hmm. if you're if you're trying to take a fever reducer, you can either take ibuprofen or Tylenol and you're nervous about it, you can ch choose the Tylenol. But like you mm -hmm. said, if you have an allergy to it, then you're, you're not going to take the Tylenol. Mm -hmm. um, what, what about in, in addition to uh, things that are a fever reducer? Uh, are there other over-the-counter medications that people should you know make sure they have on hand for if they get sick, like uh, things like, uh, like a Sudafed or a Dayquil or anything like that? I don't really know much about those, uh, the home supportive measures as far as like decongestants and things like that. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't really be able to speak to that as much. I just don't know that we have enough sick people that are, that are dealing mm -hmm. with it. I think it's mostly kind of the cough and the, and the myalgia. So I guess maybe a cough depressant, maybe one that doesn't include anti-inflammatories might be okay. But again, this is absolute conjecture. I don't, I don't think I know enough about, um, what the symptoms are like to, uh, to yeah. answer that. I'll give an opinion, and this is strictly an opinion. Um, when they say that this is a dry cough, normally what you use decongestant for is if you're bringing something up with mm -hmm. a cough. So it. it seems like maybe a decongestant would not be as helpful for this. But again, that is only my opinion and common sense answer. Um, but the things that you're talking about are are, are going towards symptoms. A lot of the um, over the counter, uh, like Dayquil type things are combination medicines. So you have to look at all the different things that are in there. And a, a big thing in there is normally Tylenol, which is a fever reducer, a decongestant, which you probably aren't going to need for that. And, um, uh, cough suppressant. So I, I really don't think that a combination medicine is really going to do that much for you. It probably won't hurt you. Um, but one of the things that I've seen that could possibly, uh, again, no real data on this, but some thoughts that maybe zinc containing supplements can help um, decrease the viral entry into the nose and mouth, the oropharynx. Mm -hmm. um, that's the nasopharynx, but the, the mouth and the back of the throat. Um, and, you know, we, we're not sure, but there's some supplements like Zycam um, or things like that. People asked online about emergency or uh, which is a vitamin C, I think, and airborne. Those, mm -hmm. I think, are more placebo effect uh, in this situation. But I have heard that possibly zinc containing supplements okay. could be helpful. Good to know. If, one, if somebody gets the virus, are they now immune to the virus? I've seen this question asked and answered to like a bunch of people online, on the internet. And I mean, the answer is, is that with a typical virus, you would think or illness that would typically be the case. There's that you should then be immune to it. There are some reported cases from China where people are saying, hey, look, um, we've gotten it again. We just don't know if that's true or not. I mean, have you, what's your opinion on this, guys? I don't think we know enough information yet. <clears throat> I think that uh, I don't, yeah, I, I, we, we don't really know. I mean, it, the you think about other viruses like the common cold and the flu, and there's multiple different strains, and we develop some immunity to these more endemic diseases. Um, and so that's why, you know, we have, we flatten the curve every year with the flu um, by doing vaccines and, and, and uh, the fact that it, we see strains of the flu every year. Um, because this is new, I, I just don't think we know any of that information yet. And it may, it may be 
a couple of years before we know any of that information. Yeah, I would say if you get the virus today and you then put or put in like isolation, hopefully by the time you get out of isolation, we have a better answer to that question. Right. There's the CDC currently so has a couple weeks or a month. The, the CDC's recommendations as far as returning back to work after a quarantine or isolation and things like that is it, it really, it's pretty vague. And I think it's vague because you don't necessarily know the answer, but um, the idea is that you should consult your, your doctor um, and he or she can tell you, uh, you know, what, what they think the criteria should be for you going back to work uh, or getting back out and, and kind of getting out of quarantine. But um, in a few weeks, we may know better, uh, hopefully. Let me circle back to one thing that Rob had just asked about the over-the-counter medications. Um, I have a friend and very intelligent colleague that is also sending me a message saying that um, I should mention Claritin. It's an over-the-counter counter allergy medicine, and we're just coming into allergy season, and a lot of people are having runny nose, cough, mm -hmm. scratchy throat, and they're wondering, is this coronavirus or is this allergies? If you take the Claritin, um, the cough caused by allergies should get better and could maybe clear up some of these allergy symptoms and, and, and let you know that maybe this is, this is just allergies. Okay. I have um, another question. Yes. Hold on. Go Rob, for it. You got one? No, I was going to say that, uh, that, uh, if you have other questions that people had been asking on, uh, on Twitter, we also have questions from, uh, that Scott has pulled uh, as well. Okay. I got okay. one more, which we saw right at the end of today, which is, is coronavirus sexually transmitted? And Mike, you could take that one. Yeah. I mean, I think the answer is, oh, is oh that yeah, <laughs> is we, we, uh, we don't think it's actually transmitted through uh, semen. However, I did see a while back one study saying that it does affect sperm. But, uh, but what we do think, yeah. what I'm pretty sure of is that human to human interactions when you're having intercourse is more than is less than six feet away. And so if you are exhibiting symptoms, unless of you're lucky, yeah, yeah, right. then uh, <laughs> they should probably not get that close to the other person. There are certain positions maybe that could be yeah. more beneficial, but this podcast isn't about that. Yeah, yeah, that's that. Uh, Tune in next know. week. Yeah, that's for, that's <laughs> for Mike's solo podcast. <laughs> right. If it's uh, a right. solo podcast, it would be with like, never yeah. Mind. Yeah. Move on. Every, everybody stick to a solo podcast for the uh, the time being. Okay. All right. I think there are a couple of companies that make solo podcast products that might do yeah. very well during this <laughs> epidemic. But okay. but speaking but speaking of oh go ahead. Go, go ahead. That we're going to bring well, in some I was questions. Just saying, in the, in the, uh, you know, speaking of speaking of podcasting, um, you know, if you are feeling socially isolated, let's think of ways to you know, have fun together with your friends, have dinner together on Skype or, mm -hmm. or, um, have meetup groups uh, and discuss, um, you know, have book group or watch it, you know, watch a TV show and talk about it. Um, and there's plenty of resources online for, uh, parents with children who are home from school, um, things that you can do with your kids at home, things that you can do with your kids outside. There's a lot of resources uh, for people to um, help make this easier uh, to stay the course. Right. Yeah. I think actually a lot of the educational software computer programs have become free. And they made free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I think, you know, I think we should post a, a list of um, websites after this that will be helpful. I have, you know, a list of a uh, website for uh, pregnant women who are worried about this. We can list the um, website for the free educational materials. I have that as well. So we'll post some links after this as well. Yeah, I also think it's very important for people uh, during this time right now to that. It's, I'm sure it's very easy to become overly uh, depressed uh, about everything that's that's going on, especially in isolation. And then we're just the, at the very beginning of this. We don't know exactly how much longer uh, this is going to last, whether it's a couple of weeks or into months even. And I think that it's going to be a very difficult time for all of us to get through. But I really think it's very important, especially while we're all home, to get off of the social 
social media to some degree, because I think it's very important to get the, all of the news that's happening and everything that's going on in the world. But I feel like that you can get that in a matter of minutes. And I feel like that kind of, I find myself doing it a lot, like constantly refreshing the, the, the feed of Twitter, because I think that the more that you get wrapped up in not just the news, but other people's opinions of the news that I feel like that that can become very toxic very quick. And I think it's something that can really have a, uh, a big effect on just your, your mental disposition. I think it's very important for people to try to maintain their mental health as much as possible right now, as much as their physical health. I think that's a great point. And one of our, uh, on the thread, somebody posted um, a list of things that you can do to decrease your anxiety, decrease your stress and keep, you know, keep depression at bay when you are socially isolated. And um, I would like if I would like to, um, to see that reposted as well, because it, it's a it's a great idea, Rob. Thank you okay. for bringing it up. Yeah. And, and the, the more you can connect with people, uh, you know, we do a ton of it in the podcast world. Connecting virtually is a is a great way that I, I've been social distancing and connecting with people online for years. So but, uh, <laughs> if anybody needs any pointers, I'm ready. I'm ready to help. OK. One of the, uh, one of the things that I've done that's uh, been frustrating, is, like you said, you refresh your news feed a, a whole lot. You see people that are just you know, bragging about not social distancing and stuff like that. These might be the people that also went to Costco and bought 400 rolls of toilet paper and are holed up in their house. They're just bragging about the one time they didn't do something or they could be lying about it. So uh, maybe just you don't have to stress out about those people, but also don't follow their example if they are actually doing those things. Okay. Uh, let's right. take some I questions for, uh, as, as well. Uh, they may be uh, some of them we already tackled and uh, or maybe some new stuff. Yes, Dr. Mike. Oh, no, I was going to say something dumb. I was just going to say that, you know, I now have no excuse not to clean the garage or, mm -hmm. and my kids, I, my kids who are constantly annoying me by doing TikToks, I'm now just not even complaining about them. Right? It's like, just become, do your TikToks, you know? Okay. All right. Uh, let's take a question. Uh, Jay Mackey says, I read on Twitter that dogs cannot contract this, but my aunt says she heard a doctor say there is a case of a dog being diagnosed. Uh, any word on this? Uh, for that is, should people be concerned about their pets uh, or that uh, be concerned about contracting coronavirus from a pet? Uh, that's actually listed on the CDC website of uh, coronavirus myths debunked uh, that your pets cannot um, contract the disease. So um, people should consider, you know, should definitely consider washing their hands anyway after playing with their pets or somebody else's pet and still avoid the normal hand hygiene things like touching their face and uh those sorts of things but no that uh that is considered a, a myth of the coronavirus by the okay. CDC. so it, it's a myth that that you can get the coronavirus from a pet or it's a myth that you cannot it's a it's a myth there's no uh, known cases of pet to human transmission uh, right. but uh, given that, again, we don't know everything about the coronavirus, I, I suppose if an infected person coughs on your dog and then you pet your dog immediately after and then touch your face, that could cause right. it. But it's not, it's not that the animals are sick and then they transmit the virus. It's not how it happens. Yeah, especially or somebody else's dog comes up to you and somebody has already just pet that dog. It's another right. surface that you're touching. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have dogs. They're dirty. Yeah, I wash <laughs> my hands after I play with them <laughs> before I touch my face or feed my kids. Okay. Uh, this is a question from Eager Turtle. Is COVID-19 more likely to be spread during flu season winter? I live in Australia where fl uh, flu season is ending. Uh, for you guys, it's going to start for us. Uh, great job doing this, by the way. Um, anything about the seasonality of the disease? And I know it's very early on and we don't, uh, and we don't know everything, but uh, that is for uh, those of us in the Western hemisphere with the, with the warmer weather coming up, is it going, do we expect this to, Dissipate we don't know to any degree. Yeah, we don't know. But I mean, if you look at the world map and the cases, I think it's not. It is not um, uh, discriminating. It is going everywhere. There, there are some uh, some hopes that it will sort of follow the seasonal flu pattern or these other, you know, way, where warmer weather has helped. Um, but again, it's just way too early to tell. Okay. And I, yeah, I wouldn't count on it and, and go out and do all your social interacting okay. because you think the weather's going to get warm and it's going to die out. Please do not do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, let's take a question from Lori. Uh, my family and I just traveled to Florida. My mom is uh, 73. Should we just wait it out? Uh, yes, right? 
Could you yeah. say the question again? My family and I just traveled to Florida. My mom is 73. Should we just wait it out? Yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you can. Yeah. I mean, we, we get that there's situations and circumstances where people need to travel. Um, you know, people got, people were traveling during this whole scenario and then the travel restrictions came into play and, you know, they had to come back and there's crowded airports and, and people need to get back to families and work and things like that. We get it. Uh, obviously like people have to live their lives and do what they have to do. If you don't have to, you shouldn't, you should avoid traveling, I think. Okay. Uh, and that's supported this, by, you know, the CDC and the Surgeon General and, I mean, uh, at all levels. Okay. Uh, let me take a question from Fat Tyson, who says, uh, what about cash, credit cards, credit card swipers? Should we be wary of the, uh, these things when handling them? Uh, you know, I personally, you know, uh, was thinking about making a trip to the grocery store. And I said, uh, maybe I need to set up Apple Pay uh, for the first time. Yeah. Hey, this is going to be a, this is going to be a good time for Apple pay. Yeah. I mean, I tried to do Apple pay whenever I can in China, they did burn the, the amount of money to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Like Candace already said that the virus does stay on paper products on cardboard for 24 hours. And so you can assume that money is the same way. It is a little bit nerve wracking. I think some people on the thread said, use a pencil to, mm -hmm. uh, touch buttons, a keypad. Other people have said to use a gas glove that they keep in their car to, when they pump gas. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and it, yeah. if you, right. If you don't have a glove, you can use a Ziploc bag or a plastic bag, um, something that you can use to handle other things. Then, you know, if you're not somewhere where you can immediately wash your hands, you're at a store, you use hand sanitizer. If possible, I ask people not to handle my ID. Can I hold it up and let you read the information off? Can I read the information to you? Can I swipe my own card? Those types of things. Yeah. And I'm Dr. Mike, if you need somebody to burn your money, I'd be happy to do that for you if you just want to send it. <laughs> I'm not burning any money right now. Right. And I'm also going to throw out there that the real Tyson Apostle should be very happy because I tried to pseudo social distance today and play pickleball, which he is the most famous pickleball player in the world. I heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Self-proclaimed probably. Um, this, <laughs> this is a question from the most famous pickleball player in yeah. the world. Wait, John, do you play? How pickleball? many other ones can you name? I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I can name, I can name Dr. Mike and Tyson. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So Adam Katz wants to know as doctors, how are you running your clinic? Can you, can you guys share a, at all? Like, uh, some of the extra precautions that you have to take while you're seeing patients right now? Sure. So I have a large outpatient clinic and we have, we have canceled all of our elective surgeries. You know, I think the surgeon general requested that today, the American college of surgeons may, you know, said that's what should be being done. It's a little bit tricky because we do cancer surgery. And so certain cancers like prostate cancer, how urgent are their surgeries or not? Bladder cancers are obviously more urgent than non, uh, than other types of cancers that we deal with. I, you know, an acute kidney stone is different than a chronic kidney stone. You know, I do a lot of infertility and sexual dysfunction. So those things are all going to be canceled. All the elective cases are. We called patients in, we called patients today for, Tomorrow and tomorrow we'll call for the rest of the week. It's obviously today, Sunday, saying that, you know, there are certain risks coming to the office. If you're not, you know, these are the options. If you're critically ill and you need to be seen by us, then we're happy to stay, keep seeing you. But what's going to happen is you're going to check in and then you're going to go wait in your car. So there isn't patients waiting in the waiting rooms. And we did also advise anybody over the age of 70 to not come in unless it's truly an urgent matter. So we gave the options to younger people. We told anybody that's exhibiting any kind of symptoms to not come in. And the elderly, we told them not to come in unless they have to. And we're going to be taking a temperature of everybody when they come in first thing. I work in a government hospital and currently um, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, guidance from other you know government entities and everything. But uh, currently our, at our hospital and our clinics, uh, we are... Um, Screening patients as they come in, uh, we have a uh, hotline in an area where patients can go and be and be screened if they screen positive for any of these things. We have limited access points to the hospital uh, for patients and staff, uh, where you have to show your hospital ID if your staff to go in. Um, and and again, just just asking the questions about travel, fever, 
cough, those sorts of things, and, and reacting to those patients appropriately. Uh, so aside from those institutional things, personally, I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm very much a, a hands-on, you know, physician in my field. I, I have to examine people and, and um, you know, examine their knees and their hips and things like that. And, um, you know, so I do all that with gloves on. I, I'm washing my hands. I'm using hand sanitizer all the time. Um, and then, uh, no shaking hands is a big thing for me. I'm a big hand shaker. Um, you know, sometimes patients aren't, aren't watching the news or they, or they don't think about it sort of thing. And, and, you know, it's awkward sometimes. I have some post-op patients that are doing really well. They want to give you a hug or something. And it's like, not right now, <laughs> you know, um, this is just not really the time for that. And so I've had, and I've done a lot of educating on my patients because I do have a lot of older patients and I want them to, to be safe and stay safe and, um, I'm not so worried that I'm going to get sick, but I'm, uh, because I may, but I'm more worried that I would get sick and then pass it on to people that may not be as healthy uh, and may get a more severe form of the virus. So um, that's what, you know, basically just practicing good hand hygiene. And, and I think, uh, again, complete conjecture, I don't know for sure, but we are going to start winding down our elective cases uh, as well and uh, and limiting our staff to, to limit exposure. Um, but again, that's, that's probably forthcoming. We haven't received definitive guidance on that. And I also want to mention that across all medical specialties, uh, many visits have been converted to vis video visits. So if you're able to do a video visit um, and set that up, if doctors are wondering how to do that, um, you know, they can um, try to try to set up video visits with patients that need to be seen, but maybe not physically examined, and also uh, doing telephone visits. I think those are all good ideas that doctors are going to uh, work on trying to set up as much as possible. But this is this is all in motion, and everyone's trying to scramble to catch up to this. But I think you're going to see a lot more of that uh, happening in the near future. Yeah, I have a few comments on this too. One is that I also like John wear gloves whenever I'm touching a patient. If you ever go to a urologist and they're not wearing gloves when they examine you, you should probably stop going to them. <laughs> but okay. I mean, that Good also, yeah, that's, that, that, that also being said, uh, yeah, I forgot what else I was gonna say. Well, and another, another <laughs> point is try to convert all your prescriptions to mail order pharmacy so you can avoid going to right. the pharmacy. There are sick people who are going to the pharmacy to get medication. So you don't want to, you don't want to expose yourself. Anything that you can convert to mail order, do it. Yeah. That, right. I have to look into that uh, myself right now. I, I'm, I was like uh, looking at my prescription and I say, oh, I got like 18 days. Uh, I'm not l looking forward to going to the pharmacy. I got to figure and, that out. And yeah. help older people that you know and your parents uh, get get a couple weeks supply or a two months supply of these medications so that they don't have to go out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that this is uh, an interesting question, and uh, I've seen people, a lot of people talk about this. This is a question that's from uh, MZ Rolls. Doctors, in your opinion, will this pandemic become worse before its spread uh, gets better? I saw a news article this morning uh, that said that 60% of Americans believe that uh, this is going to uh, get uh, get uh, worse, potentially much worse, uh, before it gets better. And I was actually surprised that that number was so low of uh, that there are 40% of people that don't think that this is going to get worse before it gets better. Well, there's 70% of people who think they're not going to be affected. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think, it's but, a, uh, I think a better question is where do we see ourselves in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and 180 days from now? I think it's really too early to tell. Um, you know, you can look at different societies and how they've handled this uh, to see how they responded. And some societies have done very, very well. Even different cities in Italy have, have done better than uh, um, other cities. And so um, you can look at the response. And I really think that, you know, if we really want this to, to quote, unquote, blow over and have it not end up being a big deal, um, if everybody sacrifices a little bit in the short term, we can uh, limit the, the effects from a healthcare standpoint and, and hopefully from an economic standpoint. I mean, you don't want to can't really overstate how this is going to affect, um, you know, the economy on a, on a local and national and world worldwide scale. So, um, you know, doing what we can over a short term period, but when we don't know exactly how it's going to play out, can limit the volume of patients and, and decrease the spread, flatten that curve, 
and uh, you know allow uh, allow life to hopefully return back to normal in a shorter time frame. That being said, I, I, don't, I think normal is going to be a little while for us. I think you know a few months is not you know three four months is not unreasonable. Uh, maybe longer. Hopefully not. Um, does that mean everyone's going to be in quarantine for three or four months? I, I don't know. I don't. I personally don't think so, but I, I just think it's too early to tell. But I do think that things we do now can help that. And I, I want to say, I feel like this is a little bit like uh, ripping the Band-Aid off, okay? It's going to hurt. You're going to have some negative effects from this. You're not going to have fun staying home. You're going to make difficult decisions. You're going to have financial hits. Everyone will. But if you don't rip that Band-Aid off now and get it over with, you're going to have a very long, hard, slow hurt. And it's going to go on for much longer. You're going to have much more financial fallout and you're going to have many more people who need to get medical help that aren't going to be able to, if you don't rip that bandaid off now. Yeah, I would say, except I do believe that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. And I think that we, you know, as a society needs to accept that needs to accept that yeah. our certain, certain ones of our individual freedoms are not going to be easily accessible to us and just accept it live with it and hopefully every you know will be su supported in that i mean there are certain things that i think would be you know like uh candace said there's going to be financial hits and not everybody can afford the financial hit so you know and this is one of the things i've been saying before when like i saw doctors complaining online that well if i do these phone visits just by the phone i can't bill for it well you know what when restaurants are closing none of the waiters or waitresses or owners are making any money either everybody's going to have financial hits and we need to sort of buckle down as a society and do what's best for society. And to me, that means exactly that buckling down and preparing for a three month stretch of this. And I would hope that the bigger businesses like the credit card companies, the banks put holds on, you know, eventually in the next few days, even announce that they're going to put holds on their interest rates or their, you know, their fees, to try to help people that from spiraling out of control, like utility state, you know, these utility companies should maybe weave, wave the next few months or just hold off on charging people for the next few months, cable, Netflix. I've seen, I've seen them announcing that, that they're not going to charge people. They're not going to cut their water off. They're not going to cut your power off. These kind of things there that are going to be forgiven. And I think that's a great point that you make, Mike that we need to set the self aside for the greater good of all. This is a time that the society and the world needs to come together in understanding and sharing responsibility and, um, and helping each other. So we are still trying to do the social distancing, but you can still help each other, you know, with understanding, forgiving and uh, forgiving debts, things like that. If you have, um, you know, people that you can share with, if you have goods and other people need food, share. I mean, Disinfect, I say, but share. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say that when you see this whole thing happening all over the world, I think probably every single one of us said, I am so happy that I'm an American, right? And, but what that means is that, you know, we are lucky to be living in America because I think we do, we are a fantastic society. But right now we have to step up and act like it and do what's for the good of the society. You just got to remember that these, these, uh, you know, these limitations and everything, these bars closing and, and these, uh, the social distancing, it's not, these are not draconian measures. These are just basically making sure that everyone sacrifices a little bit to give the healthcare system a fighting chance to take care of the people um, that are going to need the healthcare system. And, and if that number surpasses the critical number of ICU beds and all that sort of thing, then then a lot of people that may otherwise have done well and recovered and been fine are, are not going to be fine. Um, so the goal is to just prevent the surge if we can. Okay. So uh, that, let's, yeah. Let's take a couple more questions. Uh, Ashley says, I live with my 72-year-old father. How worried uh, should I be about bringing germs home to him by going to the grocery store or running errands. Uh, maybe, can we just speak to a little bit? Uh, people go to the go to the store. You come home with uh, groceries. Do you need to disinfect everything you bring home from the grocery store? I think that that is is really 
impossible to do. Every single thing has been handled many times on the inside and on the outside of, of the packaging. So we have to do what we can within reason to protect ourselves. Um, I will say the, the things that we do, and maybe some people think that it's it's too much, but um, when I go to work and I've been touching unknown uh, number of things throughout the day, I make sure I change my clothes right before I leave into a clean pair of clothes, wash my hands right before I leave. And I when I wash my hands, and I take the paper towel to dry my hands off. I hold that paper towel in my hand and I take it outside on my way out to open the doors with it. So I try to clean myself as much as reasonable before I go home and take germs into my home. You can leave a clean pair of clothes in your car and change in your car or in your garage if you have something or change right when you get home, leave a clean pair of clothes in inside your door, take your shoes off. Um, you know, maybe these things are too much and maybe it's too far, but if you have high risk people in your home that you're concerned about, you can take extra steps to be careful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Marianne wants to know if social distancing also includes your siblings and parents that live in a different house, uh, but same neighborhood. Uh, so you want to social distance from uh, everyone, even if they're related to you, right? Yes. I mean, my yeah. wife keeps asking me to social distance from her, but mm -hmm. I mean, I can keep making the same joke, but uh, no, I think that obviously you have to be doing everything within reason. Like Candace just said, if there is somebody who is particularly at risk, take precautions. But the concept of, you know, when you get home, wash your hands, change your clothes. Once that's done, if you don't think you have the virus and that you have no risk factors, then are you allowed to sit on the couch within six feet of your loved ones? Of course. I don't think it's realistic to think you're not going to. I think you're trying to limit the total number of contacts um, just for the the spread. So if you can wait, wait. If you can call them on Skype or FaceTime, call them on Skype or FaceTime. But like Mike said, when you're living in a house with people, you're going to be around them. And that that's the truth. Okay. Yeah, specifically with regard to people going to the grocery store and things like that. Uh, again, you have to live your life. Uh, I don't recommend that people go out and, and, and hoard a bunch of products and, and never go to the grocery store. You know, maybe have some critical things on hand, um, uh, maybe slightly more than you normally would. So in case you get sick and feel not well, that you don't have to go to the grocery store that week. But, um, you know, uh, people can go to the grocery store. Just be careful and practice good hygiene when you're out there. And then just be careful and touch your face. And when you come home, wash your hands. Okay. Are, are there any other, uh, you know, final tips or uh, things that you want to leave people with uh, in this discussion? Yeah. I, one thing I want to say is that I want to, the, the, the point that I've been trying to make to people and like my, my partners at work, my friends, my family is uh, everyone keeps saying, don't panic, don't panic. You know, people are overreacting, blah, blah, blah. Well, this isn't panic. This is just people making conscious decisions, measured efforts to limit exposure to a pandemic virus. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It may be awkward in some social settings to cancel with your friends if a whole bunch of people are getting together and you're the one person that bows out. But, you know, you could be an important person for preventing the disease if you, if you don't get it. So I just, you know, personally, I'm a very social guy. I, I love going to social things. Um, but, you know, I've made the decision to do that. Uh, you know, we didn't just make the hard decisions now for a couple of weeks, put that pause on life. So people who are infected can know they're infected and can seek treatment if necessary and can avoid people and, and isolate if necessary. And then we can stop the silent exponential spread, which is what many experts think the course of the disease is where we are right now is this silent exponential spread where cases will start doubling, uh, you know, uncontrollably. And I also want to add that, if you are watching or listening to this podcast, it already tells me that you care and you're you're conscious and you are concerned. So your job is to take the information that you learned in this podcast and everywhere else and share it with at least five people or more. Make have the hard discussions, have the awkward discussions, but please try to spread this to other people who maybe are making the wrong decisions and. Help this others. we want to spread. Yeah. Yes, this message. <laughs>
I mean, I, I would say that, look, 15 years ago, before there was Skype, before there was FaceTime, before there was any forms of video chat, and there were just phones, this could have been a lot harder before there were podcasts or Netflix. At this point, there's a lot of stuff that we can do during social isolation. And, you know, I, I read something that says conversations won't be canceled, relationships won't be canceled, love won't be canceled, reading isn't canceled, song isn't canceled. There's plenty of stuff. There's a lot of reasons to live. There's a lot of things to do. We're all going to get through this. We just have to stay strong for, for ourselves and each other. Yeah. And just to add to what John was saying about, uh, you know, uh, panicking and, you know, there there is a big space between, you know, panic and apathy. And I, and I think that we want to be somewhere right in the middle where we do enough to make sure that we're not continuing to spread this to other people, and especially to the people that are the most vulnerable. But we also want to make sure that we're not, you know, losing our minds and going crazy and going out to the store and hoarding and all sorts of things that are dangerous behaviors as well. So we want to be right there in the middle between uh, being panicked and not caring, just being prepared and taking precautions and making sure that we all uh, get through this because this is the first thing that I can ever remember that, you know, everybody in the in the whole world that's watching this is dealing with the same exact thing and uh it's it's you know it's crazy to think that uh every human being in the entire world we're all dealing with the same uh, situation right now and so it's something that you know it's uh, keeping us apart but it also brings us together as uh human beings and it's something that we need to all overcome well said yeah, exactly mm -hmm. all right um so let me get everybody's uh, social media because uh, especially, you know, Candace and Mike, uh, you guys have been, uh, you know, so great on social media, you know, answering questions for people. And I'm sure you guys are going to continue to do so. So how can people uh, keep tabs on uh, all the information that you're providing? I mean, I have mine up by Mike Zahalski. And I'm happy to help answer any questions that I can answer and send as many questions to Candace and John as possible. <laughs> uh, same mine is um at candace cody md and um i'm happy to field questions as much as possible as well uh, i'm at jp cody md okay all right uh dr mike thank you for putting this all together uh this was you know dr mike's idea it said hey uh, why don't we get some of the survivor physicians together so we can uh, get out there and uh help get the word out about everything that's going on and answer questions for survivor fans so uh everybody owes you a uh big debt of gratitude for putting this panel together dr mike thank you hey, rob mike. for yeah for having us and giving us the uh platform and if there are other survivor doctors out there that would love to be involved in another one of these or something like that just let me know let rob know and we'll we'll do it there's plenty of room for uh intelligent voices to be heard out there yeah and john and candace i know you guys are super busy i hope that we uh, are going to be able to talk about uh survivor sometime soon as well yeah we will we look forward to it thank you for having us okay Get back to well, who do you guys want to win Oh, what? Who's our favorite Who, to win? Yeah, Ooh, who's your winner pick? God. I'm not going to say it yet. Yeah, what? we have to save that for Survivor Night. This is, uh, I want uh, the world to win against the coronavirus. <laughs> That's right. That's Just right. put yourself on Exile Island and you'll be fine. Yeah, we're, we're, right. we're all on the edge of extinction right expert. now. Yeah, we're going to make sure we're going to come, come back into the game. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, for those of you guys who are uh, jumping in, uh, Taryn's got a Big Brother Canada recap coming up here in just a couple of moments. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and be sure to check out everything else that we have going on on Robert's podcast for uh, if you're looking to uh, help pass the time while uh, we're getting through this. So have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Thank Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.